reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. Every country in the Eastern Bloc has a huge challenge today, and that is how to remake their society from a socialist society into a capitalist society. Uh, the Czech Republic in particular uh, has an enormous challenge in front of it. Uh, approximately 3% of the Czech economy was produced by the private sector in 1991, and they have to figure out a way to become capitalists. And their window was probably short. Not they capitalists. They were capitalists before, but they were state capitalists. State they have capitalists. to find a way to be based on private property. I agree. <laughs> And how do you transform your society entirely from top to bottom uh, when you have so little private capitalism, when there are no laws or institutions uh, or accountants uh, to, uh, to, to give you all the, uh, the combinations and, uh, and productivities of a capitalist uh, society, a private capitalist society? And so the Czechs have been involved in this fascinating process of creating the rules, creating the institutions, and making the political uh, reforms necessary to, uh, to move this process along. It's, 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 it's enormously complicated. Uh, when you think about... But they've, all been, they've, all been, they've all been involved in this, Poland, Hungary, mm -hmm. every one of them. Yeah. And they, but the Czechs have probably, I, I think we would both, we would all agree, have probably done a better job. And with a different model. Yes. Yeah. Well, according right now to the privatization ministry in the Czech Republic, they're going to uh, have over 80% of the economy in private hands by the end of 1994. Now that, that is shock therapy. That's a remarkable <laughs> transition in three years. You think there's, is it? Is it going to happen? It's They're well on the way. It's happening. It's, it's happening. happening. And in fact, the political coalition that wants to make it happen is firmly in power. Uh, the socialist uh, opposition is in disarray and has no uh -huh. program. And the people that are running that show, uh, in fact, uh, from the top down, uh, Prime Minister Václav Klaus, who calls himself, uh, with some modesty, the Milton Friedman of Czechoslovakia, uh, are, are uh, very much committed to this program and, in fact, uh, have every opportunity to, to do it. So it'll be fascinating to see how it comes out. But they're, uh, they're in a situation where, in privatizing these companies, they don't even know what the assets are. They don't know what the companies own, yeah. what their debts are, uh, and, and who really controls those assets. And uh, the government really uh, had very little information in a socialist economy mm -hmm. where the government owned everything and made all those rules. And so they have, they have set some, some, uh, some priorities that uh, seem to be remarkably successful now in getting this process moving to, to successful completion. Um, and if you ask anybody in the government there what their, what their three priorities are, they'll all tell you speed, speed, speed. That this thing has to be done fast while the momentum for reform is, is politically powerful and before the forces of reaction have set in. And uh, they're, they're proceeding on, on that premise uh, with a couple of footnotes, of course. They want to give people a stake. The average common voter in that society is going to have a stake in this reform directly and they want to also establish respect for the rule of law to get assets out of the hands of arbitrary political judgments as fast as they, as they can. Going back to the first, to giving a people a stay, uh, I would say they, their philosophy is a little different. It comes to the same result. Mm -hmm. They said to themselves, we've got these so-called state enterprises. Who owns the enterprises? The people. Well then, let's give it to the people. Instead of the people owning it collectively, let's give it to the people individually. Mm -hmm. But they said, we don't really want to give it to the people and make them think they're getting something for nothing. And so we'll charge them a nominal price for it. And so they gave each one of them a book of vouchers and they made them pay. They had to buy the book of vouchers. They had to buy it. Right. But nonetheless, it was an enormous bargain. Yeah. Well, for about $30, you could buy the voucher book. And now that the shares in the first wave of privatization for the large scale industry has proceeded and they're trading those shares, it's over $600 in market value. 
Uh, so it's it's not a lot by Western standards, but it's it's a well, lot more than you got under social. It's twenty to one. <laughs> That's not a bad That's return. A high rate of return. You're right, <laughs> Tom. How did this how does this work out with the problem of uh, uh, picking up on, on Milton's point? Who gets them? Or is is there a, a monopoly, a private monopoly element being uh, created here as well, or is the voucher system uh, decentralizing the ownership? fairly well. Yeah, that's that's a very important point uh, because uh, so much of what we've seen in privatization in the West, particularly in England, mm -hmm. uh, has been privatization of monopolies, which has been about a halfway uh, success because you haven't eliminated uh, uh, all the, uh, the barriers that you should. Um, the Czechs have actually gone the other way and they have purposely broken up monopolies when they privatized them. Uh, they had a dairy uh, cartel that they essentially broke up, a uh, construction cartel. And this has been uh, very important in terms of uh, bringing more competition in. And in terms of the initial thing, every citizen of, Czech, of the Czech Republic was entitled to buy one of these voucher mm -hmm. books. Mm -hmm. and, and then you have... And 70% of the population did. And, uh, in other countries, and I, I trust this is true in your experience as well, there's also the problem of what we're trying to break up is this sort of uh, conglomerate, if you, if you will, of cross-subsidies and and all different kinds of activities. Yeah, it's, it's not just a railroad, it's a railroad that did all sorts of well, other things. Well, it's amazing. The, the government, uh, uh, the socialist regime, did not know uh, who, what firms owed what other firms what monies, because there's no bankruptcy in socialism. Mm -hmm. And so if a company borrows money from another uh, firm uh, and don't pay them back, uh, who's going to foreclose? <laughs> they just don't pay them back. And uh, there, there are all these uh, kinds of relationships and contracts or quasi-contracts that uh, have to be ha somehow discovered and dealt with. And that's, that's, that's enormously uh, complicated. Now, the thing that, that they've done in the Czech Republic uh, really has some genius to it. Milton got to, to one aspect of that, and that is what's called voucher privatization, mm -hmm. where they sold these voucher books and used those as a citizen to buy these uh, shares, uh, uh, which, which turned out to be very profitable uh, for the public. But only about half of the large-scale industry is actually being turned over in the voucher scheme. Uh, the we should say, let's go back for a moment. As I understand it, the Czech Republic classified their state enterprises in three groups. Small ones, which they auctioned off in the whole series of auctions, and simply individual checks or yeah. groups of checks bought it. The, this was in the local uh, uh, areas, about 27,000 small businesses like printing shops printing and shop. restaurants and uh, you know a dry cleaner or something like that. Then they had the intermediate size, those which say uh, went through the voucher system. Then they have the very large size, uh, 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 which are in very poor shape, yeah. in which they didn't really want to load on the people. <laughs> what, what, they're they're, they're white, white elephants. Yeah, what are they going to do with these white elephants? Well, uh, right now, uh, the uh, uh, some of the white elephants are go going to the people, actually, Milton, and and that's that's one of the interesting things about this. The, the overall scheme I th is 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 got an element of brilliance to it. Uh, here the government wants to give away these enterprises, just get them out in the private sector, get entrepreneurs making decisions rather than bureaucrats. Uh, they don't know how to define the companies, let alone how to assign ownership to private stockholders. So how do you do this? What they uh, did is they essentially came up with uh, a competitive process that goes in two waves, two waves for what they call large-scale privatization. During these waves, the privatization ministry has a very short window of about three months where it uh, accepts applications, uh, proposals, to privatize uh, a list of a couple thousand companies uh, put together by the privatization ministry, and anybody can write a proposal on how to privatize this company, this state company. Uh, you, a foreign citizen could write a proposal and say, I want to buy the company. Uh, a member of the government or a, a worker at the enterprise can say, I ought to give away some, some of the shares to the workers and then s put the rest in the voucher privatization scheme. Uh, so there are all kinds of combinations uh, of ownership uh, you, you can do. But in each of these applications, what you have to do, first of all, is define the assets. You have to uh, research who owns it. There's no title company. Uh, there, there, there's no place you can go up and look who owns the company. You have to address restitution issues because they do give restitution. If a family can prove that they have resided in the Czech Republic and, and, and get this back from when it was expropriated by the communists in, in 1948. Uh, and then you have to uh, talk about uh, how you're going to privatize a company, if you're going to pay for it or going to go to vouchers or whatnot. And finally, you have to describe what this new privatized company would do. 
who's going to work there, what products it's going to make. And the, the bureaucrats at the privatization ministry get several competitive proposals. And based upon uh, how, how well these proposals do in terms of defining ownership, and in terms of dedicating that company to, to building something productive, almost on a homesteading or pioneering principle, they award ownership rights based on these, these plans and this competitive bidding process. Now, this, this has had a, a mark of genius to it, because instead of having bureaucrats in, in, the, in Prague try to figure all this stuff out, they have the private sector and but the public it goes right doing to, this. It goes right to the heart of why governments fail because governments aren't able to collect this, put this information together. And so what you've done is you say, okay, we're going to have this competition and we're going to, and the information is generated. So the genius of it is, as you're pointing out, is that it's, you're using the private market to create the private market. Absolutely. And, that, and because you have very short windows and, and uh, you tell people they've got three months to submit these proposals, instead of people going out and politically campaigning against you and saying, no, it's not fair, the Social Democrats think it's a terrible scheme. Uh, uh, what you do is you get everybody racing to fill out these proposals and, and try to get in on the privatization, and particularly the apparatchiks. These are the guys with the inside information, so they're writing these proposals like gangbusters, trying to do everything they can to get some ownership shares out of this. And in fact, it's a great way to buy them off, because the only way they can, they can get in on the goodies now is to participate in the private sector. How, does this, how do you work the capital markets into this? What's happening in the, in the capital markets? Is there enough? internal savings to do these sorts of things? Well, uh, a lot there, of it. There's a valuation problem here and a, and a financing problem. You're, shot, there, you're, you're not in your head no here. There's no financing problem for those things that are distributed Just given away. Vouchers. Right. And that's a big help because a lot of stuff, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you just don't have a big demand for, for, say, a foreign buyer to come in. And so it goes into the voucher privatization scheme. But there are a lot of foreign buyers involved in these and a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, domestic and foreign partnerships that have submitted proposals, whether it be from Germans, Americans, Japanese. And one important thing, unless I'm mistaken, there are no special advantages to foreigners. One of the big mistakes I believe that underdeveloped countries make and that the states in the United States make is to uh, try to bribe people to come in in, mm -hmm. in their area. And that's a great mistake. Yeah. I think that uh, the Czech Republic or Hungary or any of them ought to be prepared to sell things off yeah. to foreigners, but not at, not at, at particularly advantageous terms. Well, it's very interesting. Not to subsidize them. It was very interesting that many Western companies were very much opposed to the voucher privatization scheme. Now, of course, uh, they wanted to come in and buy these state enterprises, but they didn't want to negotiate with stockholders. They wanted to negotiate with the state, the Absolutely. bureaucrats, take them out on the yacht, wine and dine, get it for a bargain. As we've seen. When, I visited, when I visited Hungary a few years ago, I had, met, had an afternoon cocktail party with a whole bunch of Western lawyers, accountants, and so on, who were there, and they were all <laughs> negotiating with the government. None of them had any use for a voucher scheme. <laughs> uh, I ended up telling them that they were, the people, they were doing far more harm than they were good so far as <laughs> Hungary was concerned. That's right. And as you may know, when Vaclav Klaus was in this country some time ago, and they asked him what we could do that would be most helpful to Czechoslovakia, he said, put an embargo on advisors. <laughs> um. Yeah, the, the Václav Klaus, now may, maybe called Santa Klaus, um, it really has given the Czech people a, a personal stake in this. And he's credible because uh, he said, look, you don't have to participate in voucher privatization. It's going to cost you about $30, and that's a lot for you people. But if you want to get in on it, uh, come on in. Uh, they all, by, by the surveys and so forth, they estimated 2 million people would buy the booklets. Uh, approximately 7 or 8 million people bought the booklets. But you know why? You know why? Because some Czechs who were in the United States, came over and organized mutual funds. Mutual funds. Well, there yeah, are a few of them, but there were over 400 mutual funds That's organized. Right. And uh, some of them were even uh, organized by state banks and state insurance companies. Now, the funds promised a certain amount of payback after the first some phase. Some of them did, some of them didn't. And uh, how's that going? Are well, they making it? Some of them are getting paid off right now. As a matter of fact, they're getting paid off more than the $600 mm -hmm. uh, in some cases. Is Slovakia, you, we start out with Czechoslovakia, as you know, with this right. whole program. Is, is Slovakia is backing off from phase two, aren't they? Uh, they've got political problems, yeah. and uh, they are gradualists. They are people who want to debate uh, about how these things should be privatized, mm -hmm. and we'll probably get back to them in 20 or 30 years to see how it's going. Uh, the <laughs> Czechs are speeding ahead, and they're transforming their society uh, virtually overnight with this kind of a thing. And it's such a refreshing thing by comparison with what we see happening in Bosnia, uh, with what we see happening in the, uh, some of the former Soviet states, 
it's such a refreshing thing to see the Czechs and the Slovak uh, peacefully and decently and in a civilized way agreeing mm -hmm. to separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the the, uh, the the really the resurgence of commerce in Prague is is uh, is visible, and uh, uh, there's just all kinds of success stories about how the transformation is going on. I uh, was just there a couple of weeks ago and interviewed a woman who was an anchor on the uh, on the national news, and she quit three years ago to buy a uh, small dress shop. Uh, in fact, create a small dress shop. There hadn't been anything selling upscale shishi Paris type fashion in, in, in Prague. When she started out just three years ago, she said her biggest problem was that nobody knew how to do anything in the private sector. She had to hire a, an architect away from a state firm and uh, nobody knew how to get permits or cl clothes imported in the country. Uh, I said, what's your biggest problem today in 1993? She says, there, there are just too many, too many of these dress shops out there now. <laughs> <laughs> Choice and competition. And how, and how are his hungry has Hungary been using the voucher scheme at all? Uh, no, not to, not to any extent like this. It's been more uh, uh, is divesting from the central to the local governments and letting the local governments uh, deal with these things. It's a, a totally different model. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a model that, uh, well, the Hungary believes that they're going to be a gradualist success. Mm -hmm. um, they started gradualism 20 years ago. <laughs> 25. 25 years ago, I'm sorry. <laughs> what about uh, Poland, Tom? Well, the polls, of course, went through the shock therapy with respect to the small business sector. Yeah. But with respect to large-scale industry, they have not made progress in privatization. And uh, there is some considerable pride in the Czech Republic that there is no office of the World Bank in Prague, uh, but there is one in Warsaw. <laughs> because the, uh, the, the, uh, the Warsaw government has worked with the World Bank on a very different privatization scheme to try to create large investment funds and then to have those basically invest on behalf of the public. Uh, the Czechs have gone from the bottom up. They've distributed the stock to the individuals, 8 million stockholders. And the stockholders themselves What's have the put their stock. What's the population Well, it was 15 million. No, the Czech Republic. 10 million. And so there are 8 million stockholders out of 10 million. Well, citizens. some of those are Slovaks now. Uh, I see. But it was about 70% oh, of, of the adult population. Yeah. And uh, those people have put their shares in mutual funds. And right now there um, are over 200 uh, major mutual funds that uh, account for about three-fourths of the voucher shares. Uh, most people, just as in this country, don't try to pick their stocks. And those mutual funds have become very powerful in terms of meeting with the, the managers of the companies and starting to redirect resources towards, uh, uh, toward, to, towards market-oriented production. Where are we in terms of the whole restructuring and the next step once these things, these activities become privatized? The, the, sort of the technical restructuring and the financial restructuring, uh, the labor management kind of restructuring. You're, you're, you're in for wholesale changes. There's no question that many of these companies were producing things that nobody wanted. Uh, the Czechs obviously did a lot of arms production, even more in Slovakia, mm -hmm. and that business is uh, fortunately dried up, uh, particularly in the Eastern Bloc. Uh, but th there has already been a drop of 6% uh, uh, employment in the industrial sector, which is uh, over 40% of the Czech economy, mm -hmm. but there's, there's virtually no unemployment. Unemployment is still only 4%. Those people are going into the service sector, and obviously that was the underdeveloped part of the Czech economy. So there is a transformation that's going on. What people say is that this transformation will have to become much more brutal, that there will have to be wholesale layoffs, uh, particularly when more of these large-scale industries go into the private sector. And so there may be some unemployment coming. But the uh, thriving service sector so far has been picking up all that, uh, that transitional well, labor. Isn't one of their big problems a brown coal area? Well, yeah, they have, I mean, they uh, have a lot of dirty, uh, very uh, costly industrial production in that and country. And very polluting. Yeah, and uh, so as soon as they uh, clean up their act, uh, they're going to they're going to have a lot of uh, costs to impose on themselves. This is the excesses of the uh, the material excesses of communism. And in, in fact, the, the the city of Prague, being beautiful, has a terrible air pollution problem. Uh, which, uh, which is quite sad. So there, there does have to be a lot of restructuring in, in all dimensions here. It's been a fascinating thing to me that in the West, uh, all of the so-called Greens blame capitalism and business for pollution. Mm -hmm. But the worst pollution in the world is in these <laughs> former socialist countries. It, it's also, and it, we see this in a place like Romania, the pollution is bad and the waste is bad because without any of the kind of price signals and competitive processes set in place, uh, a, a simple concept like maintenance of a, of a business firm or even maintenance of a public facility 
simply was not part of what was done. It was more of an, uh, rather than seeing things as a process or a flow of services, it was it was asset accumulation. Oh. And then that been working on more asset accumulation. And now these assets are, as you described, many of them just white elephants. Sure. Um, well, all through the, the, the socialist bloc, you see that there is tremendous inefficiency. And in these uh, countries like Poland and Czechoslovakia, uh, generally speaking, the rule of thumb is that they take three times as many inputs to produce an output as, as a Western country and three times as much pollution, uh, but, but, just another input. But there are two ways to interpret that. Mm -hmm. And one way is that it shows what tremendous opportunities are available. Yes. You get, it, you've got such inefficient use of resources in these countries yeah. that it means that they have the opportunity for a tremendous growth in their level of living and their level of income. I think you're looking at the, the Taiwan of Eastern Europe when you go to Prague. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I tell you, what's also healthy is to mention the competition with, is in the economic sense. Uh, e even though Hungary is, is per, uh, pursuing perhaps a gradual, the gradualist approach, and by the way, they argue, as you point out, the unemployment is yet to hit Czechoslovakia. These countries are also seeing a comp competition between themselves. And the Hungarians are very proud of what they're doing. I sit in the Poles and the Czechs. And, and uh, yeah, this, is a, this is one of the great things about the system breaking up as it did. There's, we're going to have different experiments, and we know from our Western experiment uh, that's a good thing. Well, we'll see uh, how the Milton Friedman of Czechoslovakia does. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, but what, uh, it's good that they should have uh, pride in what they're yeah, doing. Yeah, it is. You and want uh, them to have a feeling of accomplishment and achievement. And, and they can learn from one another, yeah. and they will. But they won't say they've learned it from one another. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, I don't think most Western countries, not too many Americans say, I learned something from the French the other day, right? <laughs> no, they certainly they don't say did. that very often. No, I'm afraid not. People really fundamentally only learn from their own mistakes. Yeah. It's a very rare case when you learn from somebody else's mistakes. Yeah. Well, uh, unfortunately, they're making also a lot of the mistakes that are very familiar to us here in the United States. Uh, when I was in uh, Prague, for example, um, I uh, talked with members of the Broadcasting Commission, and they had just awarded one private TV station license for the entire country, one license. Oh my gosh. And, uh, uh, you know, I've served as Chief Economist of the Federal Communications Commission, and I was interested in this question, and I asked them, why only one? I thought you were a liberal country. And they said, well, for technical reasons, you can only have one. Nonsense. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, in the U.S., we actually allocated spectrum uh, for uh, 82 stations. And if you go to Rome today, you can even see 40 off-the-air TV stations. I, I said, I haven't done any atmospheric tests here uh, in, the, in the Czech Republic, but I'd imagine if you're like the rest of the planet, mm -hmm. <laughs> you've got room for a little competition. But, of course, there's a lot of uh, the same political dynamic to always restrict entry into the market. And the United States has a long history of doing this in TV and trying to stop cable competition and all the rest. So, uh, in some cases, they're just where we were in 1952 or 1962. The other kind of atmosphere that's going to happen is that those, those Western stations are going to beam into, uh, into uh, Czech, in the Czech Republic. And it's going to be another King Canute problem where you simply aren't going to be able to stop this. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Uh, but, again, the hopeful thing about this is that the inefficiency of the former system is so great that the new system <laughs> can pr make great progress even though they have very inefficient sectors like the television <laughs> sector or like some of these other sectors. It's not a case where you have a, you've got to get the, you've got to squeeze the last drop out. That isn't the problem. <laughs> the problem is you've got a system which has been producing about a third as much or maybe a quarter as much yeah. as the system is really capable of producing. Sure. So if, and if, you can, if you can just go up to 75 percent, <laughs> yeah. you've done very if well. You make just large mistakes instead of huge mistakes. That's you're right. Much better. Well, then you must be encouraged by the United States because we're headed this way where we can correct all these inefficiencies in 20 years. Oh, absolutely, I am. Here in the United States, less than half the resources are really uh, used by the private system. And yet, we've had tremendous material progress with less than half the resources. Mm -hmm. We can achieve, the, we have the highest standard of living in the world. Now just think what we could have done if we could use all those resources. All those resources. Well, did, did you the United a, States is not an example. No, I was, uh, I, 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 a, I thought you would appreciate that comment. I gave a lecture in Poland some years ago in which I, the title was, uh, The United States is not the model for <laughs> Poland. Well, you I may say I gave that under the auspices of the USIS. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you must uh, not have thought five years ago that we'd be sitting here talking about this today. No, I certainly did not, and there's nobody in the world who did. Mm -hmm. you, you find it very hard. Uh, I suppose 
Uh, you have to give credit where credit is due. In 1984 or 5, uh, Ronald Reagan gave a speech in which he said that the Soviet Union is so inefficient <laughs> that it is going to collapse. <laughs> well, that's a great that question. So why, if, if, why were people, why was the Western world so shocked? I mean, if we really believe these markets work, we, why were we take, so taken aback? Uh, did we maybe not believe our own rhetoric? Only uh, economists <laughs> believe that the market works. <laughs> the rest of them, uh, markets prevail and exist, not because people believe they work, but because they haven't got anything better. And because the market is so efficient that it will creep into whatever corners you leave open for it and take over. So that suggests that we shouldn't have been perhaps that surprised. But it's important to see where this is going. Yeah. We'll get back here in, a, in a, a few days and a few weeks, a few years, and see how the second phase is going to go. Well, uh, I don't know how efficient we've been in our discussion, but we certainly uh, hit on some fascinating things that are happening around the world. And uh, we'll have to bring this discussion to a happy conclusion and uh, talk about it more in the future.